I am setting the spousal support in the amount of $2,000 per month, along with continuing to pay the home mortgage, child support in the amount of $1,000, and health insurance until minor child has become a legal adult. Further, if the child attends college, you are ordered to pay those expenses also, the judge said. That judgment would cost me over $6,500 per month. My wife had been screwing a number of the lawyers in her firm, yet now, I was the one getting screwed. My name is Kurt D'Angelo, and my ex-wife is Lily, short for Lillian. My daughter, my pride and joy, is Regina. To say she is a daddy's girl would probably be an understatement. Whenever she was available, I would take her to different sites with me. She had told the judge that she wanted to have me as her custodial parent, but he wouldn't hear it. The whole proceedings were BS. The monthly support was outrageous. Lily was working, earning money. I shouldn't have to support her as well as paying the mortgage and everything else. I was definitely getting the shaft, and the judge was in on it. I, however, wasn't going to take it lying down. In fact, I had already made plans to make her regret she ever crossed me. I can be a vindictive SOB when I feel like I've been wronged. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, Lansing, Illinois, to be exact. We know how to put the hurt on someone. I am what some people would call an entrepreneur. I just say, I'm a businessman that sees opportunities and goes after them. When I was young, I must admit, not all of those money-making opportunities were totally legit. Now, I'm into real estate, owning a number of rentals, vending machines, and one other business that would come in quite handy in fulfilling just one of my paybacks to my loving wife, ex-wife, that is. I own a coin change business, similar to Coinstar, with machines all over the Chicagoland area, as well as northern Indiana. This would allow me to make my spousal support payment, all $2,000, in all change. Let her bring those to the bank. They would insist that they be all put in rolls. Maybe she can get some of her fudge buddy lawyers to help count them and put them in the sleeves. Lily had stayed at home with Regina until she started school. Then, Lily worked a few part-time jobs for the next few years. Then, she got the idea to become a paralegal. She took courses for about two years and then flooded the market with resumes, trying to get a job. After about six weeks, she was hired by one of the bigger law firms in the area. Lily is smart, but I believe now that it was her looks, even at 32, that got her the job. She was one of many paralegals in the firm, but it didn't take her long to advance. She had gotten noticed by some up-and-coming lawyer, and he made her his assistant. I wonder now if she wasn't trading favors even back then. I, being the stupid husband, was fully supportive of her career choice. She would come home exhausted, but with a smile on her face. Again, thinking back, I wonder why she was exhausted, and what those smiles were for. We had been living in a nice house in Oak Forest, Illinois, a typical working-class suburb of Chicago. As she started to become more involved with the young lawyers and even the senior partners, her attitude changed. It became, we need to move to a better neighborhood. You make good money and I work in a prestigious law firm. We need to show the world that we've made it. I liked the house we were living in. We had fixed it up and made it our own. I didn't want, nor need, to live in one of the high-priced suburbs. Well, after two years of her nagging me, I acquiesced but I told her I wasn't selling our house. It was our home. We could rent it out, add it to the other rentals I owned. So we purchased a house on the north side of Chicago in Wilmette. We had to get a jumbo loan to afford the $900,000 mansion, as I called it. It was not on Lake Michigan, but it was pretty close. She decorated it with all new furnishings to her liking. I never felt comfortable there. In fact, thinking about it now, I think that was the beginning of the end for us. We wanted different things out of life. I wanted to be low-key, you know, the millionaire next door type that no one knows about. She wanted to flaunt the wealth and live that lifestyle. Now, getting back to the judge's decision in our divorce decree. I would follow his demands to the letter, but she wasn't going to like it. Over the next month I started making my plans. My daughter would get her child support, but Lily would see none of it. It would be in an account for Regina only so she could get what she needed and wanted. She would also have health insurance, the best I could find. Lily, however, was getting a catastrophic policy only. 
It would be a very high deductible policy. She would find that she would be paying for all of her health care unless she became deathly ill, then the policy would kick in. When 30 days had passed, it was time to make the first spousal support payment to Lily. I had an armored truck pull up to the mansion, and the driver knocked on the door. When she came to the door, she was not alone. One of her fudge buddies was there with her. The driver informed her that he was delivering her first month's payment. She was confused, not understanding why an armored truck was sitting in the driveway. By this time, a couple of the nosy neighbors had come out of their McMansions. Perhaps they thought she had won the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. What they saw was two guys taking bag after bag of change into the front room, emptying them on the Italian marble floor. The sound was amazing, even from across the street where I stood by my car, taping the whole thing on my phone. As the truck left, she saw me and started screaming at me. I just waved and yelled back, Hope you enjoy your fool money. I then climbed into my truck and drove away. I wasn't surprised that on Tuesday I had a man approach me and ask if I was Kurt D. Angelo. I just stood there and didn't acknowledge him at all. Excuse me, sir, are you Kurt D. Angelo? He said with a little more force. Again, I did not acknowledge him. He took out his phone, took a picture of me with the summons being offered. When I didn't accept it, he let it fall to the ground, said, You've been served, and turned around and left. After I was sure he was gone, I bent down and picked it up. I was to appear in court the following Wednesday. That gave me a week to finish all my preparations. I made the most of the week, calling and talking to people, making arrangements, and getting ready for court. I also called Regina, and we went out to lunch. She was pissed at her mother. She couldn't believe that she had become such a jerk. She again told her mother that she wanted to live with me, but she wouldn't agree to it. I said to her, I will again ask the judge, and if he still doesn't agree to it, then I will probably end up in jail. Do not do anything violent, Dad. It's not worth it, she said. Do not worry. I want it. I will be speaking my mind, though, and that might get me put in jail. Your mom will get a kick out of that, I'm sure. Do not worry about me, though. I can take it. For you, however, I have set up a trust. Uncle Ken will be the trustee until you become of legal age. He will ensure that whatever you want or need it will be taken care of. But understand this, your mother is not to receive any of it. It is for your support, not hers. Of course, Dad, she doesn't deserve anything, she said forcefully. That was my girl. She was strong-willed and was becoming quite the little adult. Dad, I'm going to go to court with you. I'm going to demand that I live with you. I do not know if that will make a difference. Wednesday came, and Regina, my lawyer, and I were sitting in the gallery waiting our turn in front of the judge. Lily came in with her fudge buddy lawyer and said, Hey, butthole, you'd better get with the program. You cannot do whatever you want, you'll see. When the judge called my name, Regina got up and went to the podium first. Excuse me, miss, this is a case involving Kurt Delash Angelo, the judge said. Well, I'm his daughter and I want to petition the court again to have my father as the custodial parent, not that jerk, my mother, she said, and looked over at Lily. Young lady, you'll not speak like that in my courtroom. Your custodial parent has already been decided. But I'm fifteen. I should have the right to choose who I want to be with, she demanded, interrupting the judge. Well, there were accusations of an improper relationship with your father, so I have ruled in favor of your mother. When I heard that I looked over at Lily, and she had a smirk on her face. My lawyer spoke up and said, Your Honor, we have no knowledge of any accusations, nor have any been lodged or brought before the court in any previous meeting. I am referring to a psychiatrist report that I have obtained. With that information, I am standing by my ruling, so that matter is closed. About four months previous, Regina was having a hard time with the divorce, as well as issues at her school so we decided to have her talk to a psychiatrist. There must have been something in those notes that Lily thought would sway the judge in her favor. I had never had any inappropriate activities with my daughter. Lily was trying to paint me as a pedophile. My blood pressure was rising. I couldn't believe Lily would lie like that, accusing me of something I had not done. The judge wouldn't even let my side be told. I stared at the judge. He would pay for this. I guess her law firm was calling the shots. 
We'll see how they all fare in the end. My vindictive nature was starting to resurface. Lily's lawyer spoke up and said, We are petitioning the court to find Kurt D'Angelo in contempt. My lawyer was almost as hot as I was now. He could see there would be no justice in this courtroom today. Your Honor, my client has fulfilled all of the terms of the divorce decree to date. There are no grounds for contempt. Your Honor, Lily's fudge buddy lawyer said, his monthly spousal support payment was delivered a week ago Saturday and dumped on the floor in her residence. So? the judge queried. The $2,000 was all in change, mostly pennies and nickels. This caused some damage to the flooring and a considerable amount of time and effort to clean up. My lawyer didn't even wait for the judge to respond. He was prepared. Your Honor, Section FIFA 103 of Title 31 United States Code states, United States coins and currency are legal tender for all debts, public charges, taxes, and dues. My client paid the required spousal support. Likewise, he has fulfilled the insurance, home mortgage, and child support requirements. You Honor, Lily's lawyer said, as of this date, my client has not received child support from Mr. D. Angelo. That's correct, Your Honor, my lawyer stated. The child support has been given directly to his daughter for any wants and needs she may have. You can ask her yourself. The judge was flummoxed. He looked at Regina, and she smiled, nodding her head. We have canceled checks for the insurance and the mortgage, my lawyer said. I looked over at Lily and her lawyer. They were scrambling to come up with something. Your Honor he said. Having the payment made in change causes an undue hardship for my client. Could we ask that in the future, she be given a check instead? The judge, finally able to get a word in, said, That seems reasonable. Before he could say anything else, my lawyer spoke up. Your Honor, before you speak further on that could you address a couple questions that pertain to that? And what would those be, he asked. Are the Chicago police part of the legal system in the city of Chicago? The judge looked at my lawyer like he was nuts, and said, Why, of course they are. Why is it then, my lawyer continued, that if my client were to get his car impounded and wanted to get it out of the Chicago police impound lot, that he would not be able to write a check, but would rather have to pay in cash or with a credit card? The judge stuttered. Uh, my lawyer continued, If the police, by your own admission, part of the legal system of Chicago, refuse to take a check, then how can my client be required to pay future spousal support payments in the form of a check? The judge, now looking like a buffoon, got defensive and said, Because this is my court, and what I say goes. At this point, I had had enough, so I stood up and said, Because you are the law, and you are trying to appease my wife's law firm. What, was she a cheater for you too? With that he blew up. Mr. D'Angelo, I find you in contempt of court and sentence you to six months in the Cook County Jail, unless you apologize to me in this court and agree to any terms I impose. Who are you? The king? King of this kangaroo court? I shouted. The judge was shocked. I'm sure he had never been spoken to like that before. Bailiff, take this man into custody. I looked over at Lily and her lawyer. They were stunned. Good luck getting your fool money now, jerk, I said, and then smiled. She didn't know how much her life was going to change. I was taken to holding, strip-searched, and transferred to the jail. Jail is a nice word for it. It is more like a prison. Right away, two of the guards started badgering me about the disrespect I had shown the judge. I wasn't scared of jail. I am six, four tall, and about 255 pounds of muscle. Working on my rental properties kept me fit. Also, I had spent a little time in juvie as a teenager. I was processed and escorted into the cell yard. I ignored all the talk and yelling. I was determined to keep to myself and always be watching my back. As long as no one messed with me, I would be a ghost. When the evening meal was being served, I got my tray and went through the line. I stood against a wall and ate as I looked around at the scum that were trying to act bigger than they were. Then, out of the din, I heard a voice that I hadn't heard in literally decades say, Tex? I had been called Tex by my street friends from my juvenile delinquent days. Tex, said Randall, also known as Ringer, what the heck are you doing in here? As he approached, many eyes followed him and turned to me. 
I sat my tray down and grabbed him in a man hug, right hands clasped together between us and the other arm around the shoulders. Ringer, wow, aren't you a sight for sore eyes? How the heck are you? Well, I'm in here, so not very good. You neither, I guess. What did you do? Basically, told a judge he was in butthole. That will do it, he said. So, how long you in for? Six months, unless I apologize to the son of a jerk. So, six months, I guess. We talked and ate and got looks from some of the inmates. Ringer told me the lay of the land. He told me he'd be watching my back, and I likewise. We talked about old times. So, what are you going to do about the ex, her lovers, and the judge? He asked after I filled him in. He knew me from when I was young. Revenge was always a part of how I handled things back then. In fact, that is how I had gotten the nickname, slash, Texless. Tex was short for Texas, as in, do not mess with Texas. Those that did, paid. They would think twice before they crossed me again, and tell others also. So the judge, what happened there? he asked. I told him he was basically a piece of crap. Oh, crap. What did he do? he asked. He took my little girl from me, even though she requested to live with me, and then he basically accused me of molesting her. Oh, crap. So, what are you going to do about it? I've got some things in the works. I kind of figured I'd be in here, so I started planning weeks ago. Anything I can help with? he asked. Maybe, but I do not know right now. Boy, it sure is nice to have a friend in here, though. He'll introduce you to some of my buds in here. It's good to have people that will watch your back and that you can count on. After some introductions, Ringer started telling some of the stories of when we ran the streets of Lansing. There were a few laughs, but mainly nods, as if their stories weren't that different. That night I lay in my bunk, staring at the wall. How had it gotten to this? I asked myself. I started reviewing my life. My childhood was rough by most people's standards. A dad that was an abusive drunk and a mom that had no backbone at all, even when dad started beating me. That drove me to spend most of my time on the streets. I hooked up with a group of guys in similar situations. We weren't a gang, even though we pretended to be. We were just stupid kids dealing with the hands that we'd been dealt. The crime rate in Lansing is pretty high, and we weren't helping those statistics. Mostly petty things, but we did steal a car or two. That is what landed me in juvie. In retrospect, that was probably the best thing to happen to me. Sure, it was rough, but I had time to think about the direction my life was going. I vowed to myself that I would do something with my life. When I got out, I did change. I started planning for a future. By the time I was 20, I had accumulated enough cash to purchase a tax-foreclosed house in the neighborhood. That became the first of many homes I fixed up and started renting out. When I was 22, I was at a club trying to get lucky. I do not even remember the name of the club. It changed names so many times in the following decade, then was torn down to make room for condos. That night I did get lucky, at least I thought so at the time. I met Lily. We hit it off. Her life had been so different from mine. She had just moved to Chicago to live with a friend. She had grown up in Seymour, Indiana. Seymour is a small town, best known for being the hometown of John Cougar Mellencamp. He had already become famous and moved away by the time Lily was born, so she had never even met him. A small Midwest town upbringing created a 21-year-old woman that had an attitude toward life that I found attractive. I guess opposites attract. We married a year later, and a year after that Regina was born, named after Lily's mom. I had purchased a house in Oak Forest to flip, but when she saw it, she loved it, and wanted to make it our home. We spent the next ten years fixing it up the way we wanted. It was the best ten years of my life, working on home projects together, watching our daughter grow up, having neighbors over for BBQ. It was the American dream. Then Lily got the job with the law firm, and things began to change, mostly her attitude. The simple life was no longer good enough for her. She had to have expensive clothes, jewelry, and the neighborhood BBQs were replaced by going out to eat at expensive restaurants, oftentimes with people from her law firm. She also started making derogatory statements about the people from the south side of Chicago. I know the reputation and the reality of the south side, but she was a hick town girl acting like she was better than most everyone else. 
We had quite a few arguments about that attitude. Shortly after, she started the constant nagging to move to the north side. Three years ago we moved, sure the school system was better, but now Regina was experiencing the north side attitude from her classmates. This was making her school life unbearable. She would say, time and again, that she wanted to go back home. I did too, but Lily would hear nothing of it. She was where she wanted to be. The event that started the divorce was a night like so many others at the time. She called about 6.30 to say she was going dancing with some of the other paralegals from her work. This night, however, I tracked her phone and decided to go check up on her. I stood in the shadows watching her. Sure, she was dancing, but with guys from the club. They were passing her around like she was free for all. They were kissing, tonguing, groping, and doing everything but screwing on the dance floor. At about 9.15, I had to go to the bathroom to relieve myself. As I was doing my business in the stall, a guy walks in and starts taking a leak at the urinal. As he was finishing up, another guy walked in. Darn Joe, you're getting hot and heavy with Lily on the dance floor. I thought you were going to whip it out right there. Yeah, she is one wild piece, the first guy said. Yeah, and she sure knows how to use her mouth, the second guy said. You know it. She told me she's coming home with me tonight. Finally, we can do some proper screwing, rather than the 20 minutes in the office or the back seat of my car. Yeah, that's nice for some immediate relief, but it's nothing like the whole sexual experience, the second guy said. Well, it will be an all-nighter tonight, the first guy boasted. Maybe next weekend it will be my turn, the second guy said as they both walked out of the restroom. I know guys like to talk, but that sounded more real than just bragging. I walked out of the restroom a minute late to see her in one of the guy's arms, kissing on the dance floor. About 9.30 she texted me, saying she had a bit too much to drink and didn't feel comfortable taking the L this late at night in her condition. She texted me that she was going to spend the night with Paula, one of the other paralegals in her office. I texted her back, that is just as well. Then she texted back, sorry. She would be sorry. I watched her grab her handbag and walk out of the club, arm in arm, with a young lawyer from her office. I followed them out. They were so engrossed with each other that she didn't see me. They jumped in his Lexus and they kissed and groped each other for a few minutes. I was getting mad, but then my south side vindictiveness took over and I calmed down, making my plans. I followed them to his building. They drove into the parking structure, so I took off for the mansion. When I arrived, I explained to Regina that we were leaving and that she should pack anything she wanted because we wouldn't be coming back. She was overjoyed, but asked, What about Mom? She's got other guys to take care of her now. She understood exactly what I meant. It took us about three hours, but we packed everything in the back of my truck. Luckily, our home in Oak Forest had recently become vacant, so we had some place to go. About eleven the next day, Saturday, she called my cell. Kurt, what's going on? Where are you? Home was all I said. It took her only a couple seconds to figure out what I meant. Why? she asked, knowing full well why. I no longer know you, nor want to. Where's Regina? With me, she no longer wants to live with you in that house. I know she wasn't sure if I knew anything about her fudge buddy or not, so she said, Come on, Kurt. Just because you do not like living in luxury doesn't mean you just leave and take our daughter with you. No, Lily, but having a wife that screws around on me is a reason to leave. Expect the divorce papers next week. She gasped and then said in her now normal derogatory way, You piece of crap, Southsider. You do not know what heck you are bringing down on yourself. My firm will eat you up. That may be so, I said, but I will win in the end. You've never seen my full wrath. Over the next six months, she made no attempt at reconciliation. She would even call me to tell me she was going out with one lawyer or another. I couldn't give a crap. There was no going back. I did have to bring Regina back. However, she had to go back to school. Regina informed me that Lily was out almost every night until at least 12 o'clock. She also told me that she kept cutting me down, saying I had no class, and that Regina should strive to get one of the rich guys from her school as a future husband, so that you can live in luxury for the rest of your life. Regina would always defend me and tell her mom she wanted to go back to Oak Forest. 
Now I lie here in jail, and Lily was probably thinking she had won. I was in jail, but I would be productive. I wonder if she thought anything of how the mortgage was going to be paid, along with her health insurance, and of course her spousal support. She, of course, would think that a few days in jail would make me come to my senses. No, they would just give me more time to plan and execute my revenge. On Thursday afternoon something happened that would change the lives of many people. Some of them I would never meet. I was ordered by the two original guards to come with us. I was taken to a video conference room. I asked, what's this about? If I am going to speak to the judge, then I want my lawyer present. They shoved me in the room and said, sit your butt down. You're not talking to the judge, but you are going to get some judgment. They slammed the door, and I started yelling at them to let me out. About ten minutes later, I was pacing the room when the door opened, and the guards let six fellow inmates into the room. I knew what they were going to try to do, and I was going to do my best to ensure it didn't happen. You do not want to mess with me, I declared. You'll regret it. One of them came at me and I punched him square in the nose. I heard it crack. Then they all rushed me. I was swinging, kicking, elbowing, and slamming them against the walls. Then the biggest one, fully six inches taller than I am, got me in a chokehold. I kept thrashing until I blacked out. I woke up in the infirmary. I was bloody, bruised, and my butt was on fire. I knew what they had done. They needed to establish dominance. And this is how they did it. I could tell by the light coming through the window that it was morning. I had been out all night. As a nurse came up to me, I looked at her with hate in my eyes, hate for the whole system that could take away my child, make me pay so my ex-wife could continue to live in the mansion, and finally put me in jail to teach me a lesson. The nurse looked at me. I was bound, so I couldn't move my arms and legs. Seeing the hatred in my eyes, she said, I'm here to help you, not to hurt you. You've been beaten up pretty badly. They said you were in a fight, but we both know the truth. I can either help you get better, or you can lie there in pain. It makes no difference to me. I could tell she had said the last words, but actually didn't mean it. She wanted to help. I tried to smile and said, Sorry, you've been through a traumatic event. I can only imagine your rage. She went away, but came back with a plate of breakfast for me. She unbelted one of my hands. Thank you, I said. You're welcome. As I sat there eating, I knew what I was going to do. Can I ask a favor, I said. That depends, she responded. One of the inmates, Randall Turner, is a friend I grew up with. Could I have him come see me? You'll see, she said in a non-committal way. It turned out that she was able to get permission for Ringer to visit me. Later that afternoon, he walked in. When he saw me, he said, Oh, crap. He knew I wasn't going to let this go. I described the six guys and two guards that did this to me. Then I said, I need to know the full names of all eight of them, not their nicknames. Oh, crap, he said again. What are you going to do? An eye for an eye with a twist. He saw the look in my eyes and knew what that meant. He knew it was not going to be pretty and that innocent people would pay. I'll try to get them, he said. What do you need me to do? Just that. I'll take care of the rest. We talked for a little longer, and then he was escorted back to his cell. Sleep that night was restless. I just couldn't get comfortable strapped to the bed. The next day, Ringer came back with the list. He again asked, What are you going to do? The less you know the better, I told him. Oh, crap, he said. The next day was Sunday, and I got a good and a bad surprise. Lily had come, and had brought Regina. Lily was the first one to talk to me. So, I see you have been getting along with your fellow scum, she said. What the fudge do you want, I growled. Regina insisted we come to visit you. Are you ready to apologize and be reasonable yet? No screwing way. And what's this crap about me and Regina? You know I would never do anything to her. How do I know? She does have an unusual attachment to you, she said. You piece of crap. Why do not you go back to your fudge buddies and have them fudge you in the butt so you can see how much crap you're full of? Just so you know, I've given them my butt, and they loved it. She gloated. Get the heck out of here and send Regina in. I'm done talking to you. She smiled in that way only a slimy cunt could. She thought she was getting to me, and she was. She was just adding fuel to the fire that would burn her butt. 
When they brought Regina in, she started crying, seeing me lying there all bandaged up. Honey, do not cry. It looks worse than it is. Oh, Daddy, I was scared seeing you lying there like that. You look like you were in a car accident. Do not worry about me, honey. I'm tougher than I look. Dad, I hate Mom for doing this to you. I hate her for making me live with her. And I hate her for saying that you did inappropriate things with me. That is just total BS. I know, Regina, I said, trying to console her. Do not call me that anymore, she said. I looked at her, puzzled. I'm Gina from now on. I do not want to be associated with Mom or any of her family. In fact, I told her that, and then told her I would not talk to her again unless I absolutely had to. I haven't either, not since Monday. She keeps trying to be nice to me, but I keep ignoring her. Gina, I said, using her new chosen name. You are more like me than you know. I couldn't be prouder about that, she said smiling. We talked some more about little things. Then I asked, could you do something for me? Anything, Dad. I handed her the list Ringer had made for me, and she immediately put it in her bra. Give that to Uncle Ken, and tell him to come visit me ASAP. My brother Ken was three years younger than me. He grew up with the same abusive drunk of a father, but I shielded him as much as possible. I also took the brunt of the abuse to spare him. He had all the brains. He really got into computer games, and from there, it was a short jump to computers themselves. We sat and talked for a little bit longer until Lily came back and said, Regina, we have to go. Gina didn't say anything to her, just got up, hugged me, and then walked out. Lily said to me, Your daughter is as stubborn as you are. I just smiled at her and she turned and walked away. On Tuesday, Ken came to visit. He was shocked by my appearance. It looks way better than it did last Friday, I said. I'm glad I waited, he said jokingly. Then he started talking to me in our own made-up language. We had created it when we were young so we could talk about mom and dad without them understanding. Now, whenever we need to speak privately, we use it. Regina. I'm sorry, Gina, he said in our language. She gave me the list. I've done some preliminary research. What are you looking for? Addresses of wives or steady girlfriends? He looked at me and then in English said, Oh, crap. Speaking in our own language, I said, that's all you need to do, then give it to Gummy and ask him to visit me without the list. Gummy was the nickname of one of my gang. Ken knew that he was still living in his parents' old house in the Lansing neighborhood. I can do that. Anything else? No, that will be enough. Do not be a stranger, though. I could use a familiar face now and then. Aren't you going to get out soon? He asked. Not if I do not apologize, and you know me better than that. You always were the stubborn one, he stated. Yeah, and it kept you from getting the brunt of Dad's drunken wrath, I said. He knew I was right and just smiled. You'll stop by within the next two weeks, see if you need anything else. That would be great. Later that week, I was back in my regular cell, and Ringer had spread the word that crap was going to go down, and that there would be heck to pay. They just didn't know what. The looks I got from the two guards, as well as the six, were looks that said, you'd better stay in your place, or it will happen again. Little did they know, they would be the ones that would be put in their place. Gummy came to visit and said to me, Ken gave it to me. What do you want? Did you hear what they did to me? Yeah, I heard, he said. Ken must have told him. Return the favor, but to their loved ones. No DNA, though. Use Steely Dan or his more flexible cousins, I said. He nodded. He knew what I meant. Then I said, all on the same day, preferably at the same time. Make sure they're told to tell their loved ones, do not mess with Texas. I'll get some friends to lend a hand, he said, and then left. Sometime soon he would exact some revenge for me. He knew how to do it so that there would be no way they could identify anyone. They would know the reason for it, though. A week went by and I heard nothing. I was also waiting for another visit from my daughter. I didn't want to see Lily but I knew she would have to be here if Gina was to come. On Tuesday morning, I noticed that the two guards weren't at work. Tuesday was not normally a day they had off. Also, one of Flash the Six Plus was distracted and seemed upset. It must have happened yesterday, I thought to myself. I spoke to Ringer and told him to spread the word, do not mess with Texas. 
Soon, a number of the inmates were calling out to me, Hey Tex! Within a couple of days, the six wasps were giving me evil looks. The two guards were back at work, and they were staring at me. Ringer Sly's friends, however, had my back. As one of Slash Chash, the six plus approached me, eight of my new friends came up and surrounded us. The guy said, You're a piece of crap. I do not know how you did it, but my girl dumped me. She told me that she didn't want to take a chance that she might get hurt again. Then she said, I was told, Do not mess with Texas. I just looked at him, smiled and said, That sounds like good advice. I told you all that you didn't want to do what you did. Now your women know how it feels. An eye for an eye, with a twist. The twist is, you hurt me. I hurt the ones you care about. Tell them all that the next time it will be their mothers. His eyes grew large, and he returned to his buddies. Shortly afterwards, the two guards came up to me and said, Who the fudge do you think you are? We're going to make your time here a living heck. Well, then I guess your wives better get used to taking it up the butt. They might even learn to like it. With that, one of the guards came at me to punch me. I didn't resist. After a minute or two of letting him beat on me, he was pulled off by another guard. A lot of the inmates witnessed it. I'm sure the cameras did, too. I was brought back to the infirmary and was met by Beth, the nurse who helped me the first time. So, we have a troublemaker here, huh? I didn't throw any punches. The guard just started hitting me, I said. Well, there will be an investigation this time. There were too many witnesses. He'll probably lose his job because of it. One less butthole guard, I said. Those guards keep you safe, whether you believe it or not. He sure didn't keep me safe the last time. In fact, he let it happen, I responded. She bandaged me up and said I would need to stay overnight for observation. I wondered if she just wanted to look at my pretty face, banged up as it was. The guard was put on suspension, pending an investigation. The other guard kept giving me harsh looks, but he was hesitant to say anything to me. Perhaps he got the message, Do not mess with Texas. It had been three weeks since Gina had come to visit me, and I was wondering what was going on. Finally, Ken came to visit, and told me that Lily was refusing to bring Gina down for a visit. That pissed me off even more. My ex-wife was keeping my daughter from me. At the end of the month, Lily came, she had almost left Gina home, but Gina wouldn't get out of the car no matter how much yelling and screaming she did. Lily had come in to see me, and she was already pissed off. Your daughter is being impossible. She hardly ever speaks to me. She's as stubborn as you are. You said that last time you were here. Why do not you get the judge to reverse his decision and give custody of her to me? I'll gladly take her off your hands, I told her. You aren't getting her. She needs to go to a good school so she can make something of herself. Oak Forest is a good school, and she liked it, I told her. It doesn't even come close to Wilmette. She is getting a great education and meeting people that can help her in the future, she retorted. Our daughter will make her own way in life. She doesn't need to ride anyone else's coattails, I countered. You're just so stubborn you cannot see the good that it can bring. Lily... We've had this argument hundreds of times. You're never going to change my mind, and I'm not going to change yours. What did you come here for anyways? I know it wasn't to bring Gina to me. Her name is Regina, not Gina. Well, that's not what she wants to be called. Do not you want her to be an independent woman? You mean stubborn, Lily said. No, I mean independent. Able to think for herself, decide what is right for her, not be swayed by a guy with money or power, or maybe a big private's. She looked at me and sneered. She knew that last comment was meant for her. So, anyways, she said, I need my spousal support payment. I have things I need to buy and bills to be paid. Well, you'll have to afford those on your own paycheck. While I'm incarcerated, I cannot receive checks from my S-Corp, nor should I. No work means no pay. That is how it works in the real world. What do you mean? I cannot afford all the bills on my salary. Well... You should have thought about that before you took me back to court, I responded. Well, you were being in butt, making the payment with change. Well, now you get no payment because I'm in jail. You have to, she said. No, I do not. What are they going to do to me? Throw me in jail if I do not. Oh, I'm already in jail. Wouldn't be very wise of them to take me out just to throw me back in. What am I supposed to do about the bills? She whined. 
I looked at her and said, Get one of your fudge buddy lawyers to pay the bills. I'm sure you're worth it. At that, she stormed out of the room. Gina came in. I was so glad to see her. Wow, you really pissed her off, she said. She expects me to keep paying her spousal support while I'm sitting in jail. Huh, good luck, I said. How are you holding up dad? Do not worry about me. I'll be fine. How are you doing? I hear you are still not talking to your mom. Not very much. Only when I have to, she said. So when are you getting out of here? Honey, I refuse to apologize to that butthole judge. The only way I would apologize is if he gave you back to me. I do not think that is going to happen any time soon. I may not get out of here until my six months are up. I understand, she said sadly. You know my birthday is coming up next month. I'd love for you to be out so we could celebrate, but I wouldn't want you to go against your principles. We can celebrate when you get out. That was tearing me up. I started reconsidering my stance. I was hurting my little girl by being in here. Then Gina said something that put it all into perspective. If a person doesn't have principles, he has nothing. Like Abraham Lincoln said, important principles may and must be inflexible. She recited. Where did you hear that? I asked. My counselor Alex. I'm sorry, Dr. Hodges, at school. It's been great having someone to talk to about all of this. Some of my teachers noticed my grades slipping and had the counselor come and talk to me. It has also helped me to deal with mom, even though I'm still not talking to her. It figures that a school system like Wilmette would have a doctor of psychology as their student counselor. Those rich kids couldn't talk to just any old school counselor. Then I said to Gina, Your mom seems to be mad at you too. Yeah, she's getting quite irritated with me. I just ignore her. I think that makes it worse, and I do not care. Well, in a couple more months, she'll have to start looking for some place to live. The bank isn't going to let a jumbo loan go too long without a payment. I figure within three months, her, slash, mansion, will be foreclosed on. But Dad, if the house gets foreclosed on, won't that wreck your credit? Honey, when you typically buy things with cash, you do not worry about credit. That stupid mansion was the only thing I've ever took out a loan for. Really? Wow, Dad. Even with all your rentals and the other businesses, you never took out a loan? Used cash from the other ones to buy new ones, I told her. Dad, I've always respected you, but now I respect you even more, she said with a smile on her face. Thanks, honey. You really know how to bring my spirits up. It was a great visit with my daughter. It did make me long to be with her on a more regular basis. Also, missing her birthday was going to be rough on both of us. I knew she would be all right, though. She was a strong kid. The next week, I heard through the grapevine that the guard that struck me was fired. It was hard to argue against the video of me not even defending myself. Within a few days, the other guard was gone. I do not know if he got a transfer or not, but at least he was gone. I had a number of the inmates thank me for getting rid of the rotten guards. I believe I gained some respect with that. Now even more people were calling me Tex. I didn't have much trouble after that. The six house were still pissed at me. I had heard that one of their wives had filed for divorce, and three others their girlfriends dumped them. Hey, maybe stupid people can learn. With the threat of more paybacks, as well as my standing with the other inmates getting better, they knew better than to try anything. A couple weeks later, I got a summons to go to the video room for a visit with the judge. I told the guard that had come to get me that I'm not meeting with anyone without my lawyer. But the judge is waiting now, he said. I do not care. I want my lawyer. Let him reschedule. My calendar is wide open. The guard hesitated and then turned and left. Three days later, I was told that the meeting was set for the next week. I asked that my lawyer and I have a half hour before the meeting to confer. They made the arrangements, and my lawyer and I met to talk about what was to occur. My lawyer told me that he had not been given any information in regards to the meeting, which he felt was odd. I guess we would play it by ear. When the judge came on the video, I could tell he was not happy that he had been put off a week. I didn't care. In my mind, he was a piece of crap that thought he was better than everyone else, just because he was a judge. My lawyer started talking almost immediately. Your Honor, may I ask what this is pertaining to? We got no information. We were just told to be here. Your client did not need to involve you, he said. 
I just wanted to see if he was willing to apologize to the court for his outburst. My lawyer looked at me, and I motioned to him. He leaned over, and I whispered in his ear. Your Honor, my lawyer said. He is not willing to apologize and asks that you apologize to him. Also, he requests that you grant him primary custody of his child. The judge looked appalled. How could I be asking him to apologize? Of course he wouldn't do that. My judgment in regards to the child stands, and I have nothing to apologize for, he said. Well then, this was a waste of all of our time. If in the future my client decides to change his mind, we will request an audience at that time. Good day, sir. One more thing, the judge said. I thought to myself, now we would find out the real reason for the meeting. Your client is not fulfilling the divorce judgment. When does he plan on making the necessary spousal support and mortgage payments? My lawyer leaned over to me and I whispered in his ear again, Your Honor, he has no plans to make any payments while he is incarcerated. But his house is going into foreclosure, the judge said. Not my home, maybe my wife's mansion, but it's not my home. I never wanted it, I said directly to the judge. This will ruin your credit and you will lose all your equity, he said. Small price to pay to see my loving ex-wife street walking where she belongs, I said. Then I said something that I knew would pee him off. Perhaps all of her fudge buddies can make the payments. I'm sure between the dozen of you, you can come up with the money. I knew that by implying that my wife was a cheater and that he was one of her johns, he would go ballistic. You no good piece of crap Southside scum. Who do you think you're talking to? I cut him off as he was about to continue. I think I am talking to someone who has partaken of my wife's body. If I am wrong in that, then I am sorry. I just cannot understand why someone with no skin in the game, as it were, cares so much. With that, I got up and went to the door to be let out. I heard the judge say, Counselor, your client just earned himself two additional months in jail. If he continues to disrespect me, I will make his life a living heck. I smiled as I awaited the guard that would bring me back to my cell. I could tell he had been listening because he had a dumbstruck look on his face. He couldn't believe what I had just done. When I got back to my cell, I was all hyped up. Apparently, my wife had said something about the mortgage to her fudge buddies, and they in turn spoke to the judge. What a screwing rat's nest. Their time was coming soon. The next Sunday, Lily couldn't resist coming to see me in jail. Luckily, Gina caught wind of it and made her take her along. So, I hear you pissed off the judge again and got another two months in jail. When are you going to learn? You cannot fight the system. Lily, why do not you just not talk to me anymore? All you do is want to show your north side attitude. I do not need it. All I need is for you to make sure Gina gets to visit me on a regular basis. She practically yelled, It's Regina! I turned around and wouldn't talk to her. She just kept on whining. Finally she left and Gina came in. When she came in, she had a huge smile on her face. I asked her why she was so happy. Because I get to see my dad, she said. That cannot be the only reason, I said. Well, I do have a surprise for you, but I cannot tell you what it is yet, not until I work it all out. Dad, do you trust me? With my life, I said. Then will you sign this paper without reading it first? She asked, as she held up a piece of paper folded over. I looked at her warily. What are you up to? You'll have to wait and see. I thought you trusted me. I smiled at her and signed the paper. She had it folded so only the spot where she wanted my name was available to see. Mom told me that you did something to get your jail time extended two more months, is that right? Yeah, sorry, honey. What did you do? Had a run-in with the judge again. Well, whatever you did, he probably deserved it. We talked some more about school and her mom. She kept talking about this Dr. Alex Hodges and wondered what was going on. I tried to get her to tell me what she had planned that involved my signature, but she said it would have to stay a surprise. Well, I'm sorry that I won't be available for your sweet 16, but when you come to visit me next time, I'll have a birthday present for you. What is it? she asked. That is a surprise, so I guess we both have surprises waiting for us, I said. At the end of the visit, I asked Gina to have Greg come to see me. Greg was my right-hand man. He helped me with all my business affairs. Sure, Dad, she said. I had given Greg a few specific jobs to do when I figured that I'd be put in jail. Hopefully he has been able to do them. 
Now I had another job for him, Gina's birthday surprise. Later that week, Greg came to visit. He had, in fact, been able to accomplish quite a lot of the things I asked to be done. Then I asked him to work out my birthday surprise for Gina. He looked at me and said, Are you sure? Yes, I am. It's the perfect gift for her. Okay, I'll speak to our lawyer, he said. Also, visit my brother, Ken, and give him what you got. He'll know what to do with it. If he has questions, have him visit me. If not, tell him to get with Gummy. Will do, he said, and left. I just smiled, and kept a smile on my face all day. Gummy knew my devious mind and would exact my revenge while I was blamelessly sitting in jail. By the end of the month, my popularity with the inmates had risen. That guard must have told someone how I treated the judge, and just like every other organization, the rumor mill had the news spread throughout the inmates. Pretty soon, everyone was calling me Tex. Also, by the end of the month, I had a visitor. I went to the room and saw Lily sitting there. I went to turn around and leave when she said, Kurt, please stop. I need to talk to you. I have nothing to say to you, Lily, I replied. We're going to lose our house. You have to give me some money to stop the foreclosure, she pleaded. That's your house, Lily. I never wanted it, but you just kept nagging me until I gave in. The house means nothing to me, and in the down market we have no equity in it. Let the bank take it. Kurt, you cannot do that. You have to help me. Go ask your fudge buddies for help. I'm sure that they've got enough money. Then you can truly be the cheater you are. Why are you doing this to me? She cried. Why did you lie and tell the judge that I was molesting our daughter? She didn't know what to say. She knew she had done me wrong. She broke down crying and I walked out. It felt good to get that all off my chest. As I was being escorted back to my cell, the guard got a call and was told to bring me back. As I walked in, expecting to see Lily sitting there crying and wanting to beg me again to help her, I was surprised to see Gina. Gina, your mom didn't tell me she brought you. I wouldn't let her come without me, she said. I'm sorry I missed your birthday, I said. But I do have a present for you nonetheless. Dad, I knew you would miss it, and I do not care. I still love you. Also, you do not have to give me a present, she said. What a wonderful daughter I have, I thought. Well, I do not have it with me, in fact. That would be impossible. But I can tell you what it is. Gina, the Oak Forest home is yours. It is being put in a trust for you, for when you become an adult. Once I get out of here, can I stay there? Of course, I'll pay you rent. Her eyes got wide, and a huge smile came over her face. Dad, oh my God, you have just eliminated a huge hurdle that was holding up your surprise. I still cannot tell you, but when I do you will understand. I love you so much. I love you too, honey. I was baffled as to what the surprise might be. It must have something to do with our home, not the, slash, mansion, our real home. We were both all smiles as we continued to talk. She again spoke of Alex, her counselor. I was wondering if maybe she had a crush on him. I hoped that he was professional and had no ulterior motives toward her. I would have to meet this Alex as soon as I got out of here. As I was escorted back to my cell, I had a huge smile on my face, both for the verbal battle with Lily and the wonderful talk with Gina. The other inmates wondered what I had done now. They knew by now that a smile meant someone was hurting. Then one day, I got a visit from Gummy. Everything was ready. Video of my wife, other paralegals in her firm, some of them married, as well as hookers getting screwed by most of the lawyers in the firm, as well as up-and-coming Democratic politicians, and a certain judge that I knew all too well. They were all bragging about how they were above the law and could do anything. It's amazing. People do not pay attention to the hired help. Cleaning people can come and go at will. To someone doing the menial labor of cleaning the offices after hours, money talks. Free rent for a year talks a lot. We just had them put hidden cameras in the conference rooms and the offices. I knew I would get enough damning evidence to upset some lives. My brother, anonymously of course, would be posting the videos online with a tagline, Do not mess with Texas. They would be sent to strategic sites, and also video would be sent to all the news outlets and tabloids in the state. The different outlets would be having a feeding frenzy to see who could create the most news out of it the politicians and the lawyers would be scrambling to do damage control. I smiled and said, 
In a week, go ahead and let the others know what has to happen next. He said, I will. As I walked back to my cell, I had another big smile on my face. Ringer saw it and knew that I had just spoken with Gummy. He said, Oh crap. I just nodded and smiled more. When the videos hit, I was lying in my bunk and I heard the murmur going around the jail. Obviously, somehow, the news had reached our little corner of heck. I started hearing it spoken openly. Do not mess with Texas. I was surprised a few minutes later when the big guy, one of Flash Tash the Six Plus, stopped by my cell and said, You're one bad loser. I'm sorry for what I did to you. I told you all that you didn't want to mess with me, that you would regret it. Now more people are regretting messing with me. I repay kindness with kindness and violence with violence. Well, I hope you accept my apology. Sure, just remember, just because you're big doesn't mean you cannot get hurt. He nodded and left. About three days later I was summoned again by the judge. He had already called my lawyer and he was on his way. We sat in the video room as we were waiting for the judge to connect. I wonder what this is about, he said with a smirk. Only time will tell, I said with a grin on my face. Oh crap, he said. When the judge came on he looked at me with fire in his eyes. You did this, he yelled. What are you talking about? I said in a deadpan voice. You're Tex, right? He was still yelling. Some people call me that, I said calmly. You'll pay for this, he yelled again. You've been in jail for the last four months. How could I have done anything, I said matter-of-factly. You have friends. We all have friends, Your Honor, I said sarcastically. You won't get away with this, he spat. I do not know, Judge. You may be out of a job soon, and I hear your wife is divorcing you. You'd better call off your dogs, he demanded. Now you're calling my friends dogs? I'm not sure they'd appreciate that. You know, if you corner a dog, you're liable to get bit. Are you threatening me? he asked. No, just stating an old adage, I said. I'm going to make your life heck. When you ever do get out of that slime pit of a jail, you had better watch your back. One day, you're going to find yourself having to answer to people that couldn't care less about your life, and I will be happy with whatever they do to you. He then cut the transmission. I turned to my lawyer. Did you get that? Sure did, he said, holding up his phone. More fuel for the fire. The Bar Association will be interested to hear that. It seems that intimidation is a felony in Illinois. A few days later I had another visitor. It was my wife again. Oh, it's you. I thought I made it plain to you that I no longer had anything to say to you. You jerk, she yelled. What are you talking about? I asked calmly. You got me fired. My picture is all over the news and the internet. How could you do this to me? She whined. You did it to yourself, I said. Do you hate me that much? Yes, and all your fudge buddy lawyers that think they're better than everyone else. I spat back. I continued. When we first met, you were a nice small town girl with a great personality. Now you're just an uptown jerk with no love for anyone but yourself. What am I going to do? I have no job, and right now no one will hire me. Move back to Seymour and live with your folks, I proposed. I cannot, the local paper's headline was, Local Girl at the Heart of Chicago Scandal. My parents are taking early retirement and moving to Florida to avoid all the talk. Florida seems to be a good place for you. You will be that much farther away from me. They want to have me. They hardly want to talk to me. Wow, your parents hardly want to talk to you, and your daughter hardly talks to you. Maybe it's you? I said, I guess you should move and start over somewhere. You'd better not take Gina with you, though. As soon as I'm out of here, I'm going back to petition the court for primary custody. I've got to believe, with your reputation, they will reconsider you as the best moral example for an impressionable young woman. You cannot do that, she said. She's all I've got left. Lily, I do not give a crap. You did this to yourself. We had a good life. Then you had to go screwing around. Hey, that's a thought. You could become a cheater for one of your fudge buddy lawyers. I'm sure there is a market for an almost 40 piece of butt. She looked at me. All I saw was pain in her eyes. She set her forehead on the table in front of her, and just cried. Sucks to be you, I said. Then I asked, did you bring Gina? She practically blew her top, saying, it's Regina, and no, she's doing something with that doctor friend of hers. Well then, 
I have nothing more to say to you. Do not bother coming back unless you bring Slyche, Gina. I turned and walked off as she was still fuming. I didn't have a smile on my face this time. I actually felt sorry for her. She was broken. The next day, I saw a news report from overnight. Apparently, the top floor of a five-story office building downtown had caught on fire. The sprinkler system kept the lower four floors from being destroyed, but the top floor was gutted. I just smiled. Ken came to see me the next day and told me that the law firm's off-site server had had a meltdown. All of their data was lost. Again, I just smiled. A couple weeks later, I had another visitor. It was Gina. She must have bugged her mother to bring her. She walked in with the biggest smile that I had ever seen. Gina, I called to her. You seem unbelievably happy. What gives? I have finally been able to finish my surprise for you. You'll never guess what it is. Well, I know from our last conversation that it has something to do with the Oak Forest house. Do not tell me that you and your mom moved back there. I know she would rather live anywhere than there. You're half right, she said. I looked at here puzzled. Mom is being evicted from the Wilmeet house, and I am moving to the Oak Forest house. How can you do that? The court order gave her primary custody until you become an adult? I asked. That's the surprise. I am legally an adult. Now I was really puzzled. Huh? I got myself emancipated. That is what Alex and I have been working on for the last two months. Once you put the house in trust for me, it was a slam dunk. I needed some place to stay that would be safe, and our old neighborhood is perfect for that. So, let me get this straight. You are considered a legal adult now? Yes, when I started having all the problems with school, due mainly to problems at home, Dr. Hodges helped me to alleviate that problem. Once you get out of here, you can move back home. I cannot wait to go back to high school in Oak Forest. I've already talked to a number of my old friends. They cannot wait for the summer to be over, so school will start up. Mom did say you were spending time with your counselor. I'd like to meet this Alex, I said. I was still leery about this older guy paying so much attention to my daughter. Well, you're in luck. Alex brought me here today. Now I was really getting concerned. He's driving her around Chicago? It'll be right back, she said as she headed toward the door. I had to assess the situation. How should I tactfully let Alex know that he's walking a thin line when it comes to his intentions with my daughter? I didn't want to upset my daughter, but I did want to put the fear of God into him. When Gina walked back through the door, she was followed, not by a man, but by a gorgeous, raven-haired woman. She smiled at me with a smile that said, How have you been? I took a closer look at her and said, Freddy? She responded with, I haven't heard that name in about twenty years. Freddy, or more correctly, Alexandria Frederico, was from my neighborhood. She didn't hang out with my gang, but we went to school together. Gina looked at both of us, confused. Dad, how do you know Dr. Hodges? Freddy, or Alex now, I guess, answered for me. We used to live in the same neighborhood. He wouldn't give me the time of day back then, though. I turned to Gina. She was a couple of years behind me in school, and we didn't really run in the same circles. And you were a juvenile delinquent back then, she said with a smile on her face. I see you haven't changed much, pushing forty and in jail. My face turned red. Then I said, I still cannot keep my mouth shut when it's appropriate. That sounds about right, she said. I've heard that I should probably be calling you Tex. Huh? Gina said. Why would you call him that? That was his nickname when he was a teenager. He was never afraid to take revenge when someone did him wrong. Your mom definitely has done him wrong. And unless I'm totally wrong, I bet the news about the law firm is all Tex is doing. I plead the fifth, I said. Before we go on, I wanted to say that I hope you do not mind that I've been spending time with Regina. It's Gina, Regina said. Sorry, I forgot, she said. Then she looked at me again and said, When I first started talking to Gina, about nine months ago, she was pretty upset about everything that was going on in her life. I wondered if maybe she was related to you and Ken, D. Slash Angelo isn't it a very common name. When I looked up her records and found out her father's name was Kurt, I still wasn't sure. I always knew you as Tex. When she told me you were in jail, I was pretty sure it was you. I was pretty bad back then, I admitted. You must have changed and gotten successful to have a home in Wilmette, she stated. 
It's just a house, it was never my home, I said. Then Gina spoke up. Yeah, our real home is in Oak Forest. South side, but in a much better neighborhood than where we grew up, Alex said. Yeah, if only we'd stayed there, maybe we wouldn't be where we are today, I said, then became somber. It was probably true. If Lily would have been satisfied with our loving home, we would still be happily married. We talked for a little while longer, and then I pulled Freddie aside and said, I really appreciate you taking time away from your family to help her out. Thank you also for helping her become emancipated. That is going to change everything. That's okay, Tex. She is like family to me. I've become quite attached to her. Well, thank you again. When you get out of here, you can take us all out for dinner somewhere, she said. That I will do if I ever get out of here. The next two weeks went by with no new developments, just daily routine in the jail. Gina and Freddie did stop by on both of the Sundays for a visit, though. I really appreciated Freddie taking Gina under her wing. Gina told me that Alex helped her decorate the house. They bought all new furniture and other decor items. When I asked where they were getting the money, she said, From Uncle Ken, of course. I do have money set aside for my needs, right? Yes, I just didn't want to find out that Freddie had been paying for anything. She's been a great help, but no, she hasn't bought any of it. I hope it isn't all girly stuff. I would like to feel at home there. Do not worry. Your man cave is still a man cave. She was talking about the basement. I had fixed it up for a refuge for me. Living in a house with two females can get to you after a while. You just need somewhere to retreat to. After they left, I was lying there thinking about how my daughter was growing up. Now she was a legal adult. I would be on my own soon enough. In a couple of years, she'd be heading off to college, and then who knows where. I hoped that I could meet someone that appreciated the simpler things in life. Then on Monday I got another visitor. It was Lily again. When I saw her, I turned around and almost got back out the door. Then she said, Kurt, wait, we need to talk. I turned back around. Now what? I thought. Do you know what our daughter did? What are you talking about, Lily? I asked. She went and had herself emancipated. She no longer has to live with either of us. In fact, she has already moved out, and I do not know where she's gone. Oh, that, I said. So, you know, did you put her up to this? She accused. No, she did it herself. Her school counselor helped her. So where is she staying with the counselor? No, she's moved back home. She's moved back to the south side? What about school? She asked. She'll be going back to Oak Forest in the fall, I said. She hated that Wilmette school, Lily. She was always put down for being a kid from the projects, as they called it. She was never one of the upper crust. You took her out of a school she liked and had a lot of good friends and put her in a situation that hurt her self-esteem and gave her an inferiority complex. You did her more harm than good by moving her up there. I was just trying to ensure she got a good education, she proclaimed. Kids learn more from their parents' example than they do in a classroom. We were her teachers for what she will face in her life. What do you think your example is going to teach her? I hope it teaches her what not to do. Our job, as parents, is to raise law-abiding, responsible adults. I hope we have accomplished that, and I hope she'll overlook our failures, especially our marriage. It wasn't all bad, she said. No, but it sure ended up that way. Lily, I hope you find what you're looking for. Obviously, I didn't have it. She looked at me. I could see the sorrow and regret in her eyes. I got up from the table and walked out. Again, I felt sorry for her. The day finally came when I was to be let out. I was summoned to actual court this time. Gina and Freddie, as well as Lily, were there. As I sat there waiting for the judge, I was wondering what he would have to say this time. I was still not going to apologize. The bailiff directed us to all rise. We stood as the judge walked in. It was not the same judge. Hmm. I wonder if he did lose his job. The judge looked at all the facts presented to him in regards to my situation. Then he looked at me. So, Mr. D'Angelo, what do you have to say for yourself? I hesitated and then said, I guess I have to say for myself that I have fulfilled my initial six months plus an additional two more. At any time you could have apologized and been set free, he said. I did not feel that the other judge deserved my apology, so I fulfilled his sentences. You are a stubborn man, Mr. D'Angelo. I prefer to call it strong-willed. 
and it helped me to succeed in business and in life, I replied. In regards to your divorce settlement, that still stands, and you will need to pay restitution for the months that you did not fulfill them. Then my lawyer spoke up. Your Honor, my client will gladly pay what he owes. By our figures, that is a little under $20,000. He will generously pay her the full $20,000 today, with the understanding that he has fulfilled his financial obligations and will not pay her any more. With that, Lily stood up and said, What? You owe me more than that, and need to continue to pay me until Regina turns 18. Miss, the judge said, I will handle all transactions in my courtroom. Now, Counselor, how did you come up with that figure? Your Honor, my client paid the first installment of spousal support, mortgage, and insurance, as well as supplying his daughter money for her support. He continued to pay for the insurance and his daughter's support throughout his incarceration. He did not pay his ex-wife her spousal support, nor the mortgage payment, because he was not working, and therefore could not draw a salary. Now that he is again able to work, he can start earning money. The judge looked at the figures and then said, Your client was incarcerated for eight months. Just the spousal support alone would be $16,000, not to mention the mortgage payment. Your Honor, if you will read the transcript of the court judgment, it states that, until minor child has become a legal adult. Your Honor, the child in question has been emancipated for the last three months. The legal documentation is before you, and the house was foreclosed on three months ago also. Thus, there could be no payments made on a loan that no longer existed. Therefore, we have the breakdown in front of you as to the amount owed as $19,182. He will gladly pay her a full $20,000 and consider his relationship with her terminated in every way. He looked at the transcript and then back at our figures. He couldn't see how he could get around what was plainly in black and white in front of him. I will have to do a little more research on this, but if what you have given me is correct, then I will accept this figure. Then he looked at both Lily and I and said, You have a child together. Yes, she is legally an adult in the eyes of the court. However, she is still a teenager with teenager problems and needs. She will need both of you to be civil to one another so that she can continue to mature in a healthy manner. You should all be civil to each other. Then looking directly at me, he said, and you should be civil to the others involved in the events that led to your divorce. Can I get your word on that, Mr. D'Angelo? Yes, Your Honor, I said. Mrs. D'Angelo? he asked. Yes, Your Honor, she said. And Regina? he said, looking into the gallery. It's Gina, but yes, Your Honor, she said. Then, unless these figures turn out to be false, I will close this case, and Mr. D'Angelo, you are free to go. Thank you, Your Honor, my lawyer responded. As we stood and started heading out, Gina ran up to me and gave me a huge hug. Freddie stood by with a smile on her face. I could see Lily glare at us as we were talking. Then Lily came over to me and said, $20,000? That's it. That's BS. Why? You chose your new men over me. They can help you to get off your back and back on your feet. You son of a jerk, you cannot do this to me. Lily, the judge asked us to be civil to one another. Let's do this for Gina. It's Regina, Lily spat. Our daughter, okay? What am I supposed to do? I have no job, no place to live, nothing. You can get another job, and as far as a place to live, I can help you out there. I can put you into one of my rentals, rent-free for six months. That way you can concentrate on getting your life back in order. You want me to move back to the south side? She whined. It's free rent. How can that be wrong? Ugh, she exclaimed. Then I turned toward Gina and Freddie. Ladies, are you ready to go? Sure, they both said. Freddie, I believe I owe you a nice dinner. I seem to remember something like that, she said. Well, let's go to RPM Italian. I made a reservation when I got confirmation of my release date. I really need to cleanse my palate of the jail food. I saw Lily out of the corner of my eye. I could tell she was furious. That was our restaurant. We went there together for special occasions. The reservation is for 6.30, so we have a little time. Do you mind if we drive around for a bit? I just need to get used to being free, I said. Then I said to Freddy, I made the reservation for four. Can you call your husband and see if he's available? She became silent, 
and her face went expressionless. Then Gina said, Dad, she doesn't have a husband, not anymore. Then she said to Alex, I'm sorry, Dr. Hodges. I never told him. I didn't understand. The few times we talked, she always wore a wedding ring set. Even now she was wearing it. What was I missing? I'm sorry, Freddy, if I offended you, I offered. No, do not be. You didn't know. My husband was killed on the Eisenhower about five years ago. Some big rig changed lanes and drove Mike into the divider. They say he died instantly. I am so sorry, Freddy. I didn't know. I just assumed since you're wearing rings that you were married. Yeah, I just haven't been able to take them off yet. Somehow I feel if I do, then I will be throwing him away. I know, psychologist with a mental problem. I've heard it before. Well, I'm sorry. Will you join us so I can try to make it up to you? She looked somber, but said, I think that will be okay. I had been so focused on my problems and my revenge that I never even asked her about her life. I felt like such an butt. I would have to change that. Starting tonight, I would be open to hear whatever she wanted to tell me about who she is now and how she got there. I would be a better friend. The meal was great. It felt so nice to be wearing regular clothes and not have to worry about always watching my back. The freedom felt a little odd to me, though. Eight months will do that to you. By the end of the meal, I was feeling better about everything. I took a chance and said to Freddy, Alexandria, when you're ready, would you allow me to take you out on a real date? I do not care how long that takes. Whenever you feel comfortable. In the meantime, can we stay in touch? Dad, of course we're staying in touch. She isn't getting rid of me that easy, my daughter said. And I wouldn't have it any other way, Freddy said to Gina. Then she turned to me and said, Mike and I never had any kids. Between my schooling and him starting up his financial planning business, it just wasn't the right time. So having Gina as a surrogate daughter has been very therapeutic. I hope you do not mind. After all you've done for us both, I wouldn't have it any other way, I stated. As we left the restaurant, Gina said, I hope you like the look of our old house. Anything is going to be better than where I've been for the last eight months, I said, and chuckled. When we got there, I was surprised. The shutters had been painted and the bushes were all trimmed. It looked great from the outside. I was eager to see the inside. As I walked in, it looked different than the way I had left it, but it felt more like a home than it ever had. I could see Freddy's touch on the place. I know it sounds cheesy, but I started tearing up. This hardened criminal was crying. Kurt, I heard Freddy say. I wiped my eyes and said, I feel at home. Kurt, Alex said. I turned to her and she said, I think I'm ready. I looked at her puzzled. She took off her rings and smiled at me. I couldn't help it. I smiled back. Then we hugged. Epilogue. Ten lawyers, four paralegals, six politicians, and a judge had their careers and marriages ruined by the events that led to my divorce and the aftermath. Stubborn or strong-willed, either way, sometimes it pays to stand by your principles. On the bright side, Gina got a new mother and also a new brother and sister, albeit they were about 18 years younger than her when they came along. One is named Frederick, the boy, and the girl is named Alexis. They were twins, and I loved the fact that I could name them both after the person that helped me start a new life. Oh, Lily? She got married to a rich lawyer. I guess she finally got what she wanted. I thought we had it all. A loving family, a good home and good neighborhood, a healthy child, a thriving business that meant no real money worries. I guess to me we had it all. To her we didn't have one thing, status. Now she has her status, married to a rich lawyer, living in a big house in Winnetka. What she also has is a husband that is a misogynist philanderer that doesn't love her, just keeps her around for appearance of a stable home life. I hope she's happy. I know I am.